John Morrison, we're actually at the Yorkshire Trench now. History of this particular uh, trench system here is it was originally dug by the French uh, beginning in 1915 and it was expanded and improved by the British from the April 1915 onwards, mainly by the 49th West Yorkshire Division. It's quite a deep trench. If you swing to your right, if the camera swings to your right, you can see the airframes. This is the type of frame that was put in, in the bottom of it. It's got a castellation in it, so it's zigzagged to prevent blast from shells going directly right down the trench itself. About 150 to 200 metres to, to the north of here, to the north east of here, is where the German front line would have been. And underneath the front part of this trench system is a bunker system, quite a deep bunker system actually, and it became uh, a headquarters for a brigade uh, from 1917 onwards when they had the attack on Passchendaele. Uh, the actual trench itself is in pretty bad condition, it's in a bad state of repair which is why we're trying to raise the money for it. As you can see we're just going to have a little a short walk around it and I'll show you what the state of the infill of the trench is at the moment. Which the City Council of Ypres have had to put sand in to keep both sides of it apart. That's why it's so important that we try and get some money in to preserve this particular um, section of trench line. the actual base of the trench itself has had to be filled in with sand to keep the two sides of it apart, stop it from falling in on itself. The actual bunker system itself below it, um, the water table and with climate change has started to drop which means that the actual timbers are becoming exposed which means there is a, a, a bit of a, a problem that it, it would collapse which is why we, we need to preserve it and strengthen it. If you come this way You've got an even deeper sand infill into the base section of the trench. You've got a, a sniper's position here at the front with its plate. And then you've got at the back, you've got Livens projectors. These were particularly nasty little mortars that fired uh, bombs, shells, chemical, anything that were toxic in the direction of the German trench. To the base of here, the airframes that were put in by the diggers, the archaeologists, when they did this particular um, reproduction of the trench after they'd, after they'd actually done the archaeology on it, and they put the wriggly tin in the bottom section against the against the trench walls, and the airframe that we've just seen to re to reproduce it. But as you can see, over the past um, 25 years, it's got in a quite a, a bad state of repair. And the far end of the trench is actually worse than the left hand side as we've seen. Um, this is had to have a lot more sand and as you can see from the cracks in the in the uh, in the wall it's uh, the whole section of the wall itself it really really does need quite a substantial amount of money um, spending on it. Right, we're just going to head down into the trench itself and I'll try and explain a little bit about why it was here. Originally, the trench itself was a group of, of really shell scrapes, very, very um, low-lying, low-dug low um, trench systems dug by the French, um, by, the, by the North African Division here, um, because the Germans in the first Battle of Ypres were coming towards this particular area. Later on, um, in 1950, the British moved in here, the 49th West Riding Division moved into this particular sector and took over from the French and they realised that it was just a shell scrape and what they had to do was to build up the sides of it and, and to, to, to make it some sort of substantial trench system. Hello, um, so they sandbagged it, they airframed it, they put wriglet in it which is not in this particular section but is in the other section um, and they, they made it a much much uh, safer and, and, and much more capable place to fight the Germans who were literally 150 to 200 metres in front of it. To his left was the International Trench, which was so called because it kept being taken by the Germans, then taken by the British and taken by the Germans, and the losses were, were quite um, incredible. When they actually excavated this site, they found the bodies of 155 soldiers, most of whom being killed in the, the attacks in the July of 1915. Later on, they found more soldiers who had been killed um, in, the second, in the Third Battle of Ypres, um, which were part of the Welsh Division that, that, that attacked the, uh, the Germans in the Battle of Passchendaele. 
we look here, there's a bunker system. The bunker system was put in um, for, for the Welsh um, and it's begun to actually dry out. The, 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 the level of water has dropped a lot of it through climate change. At one time it used to be flooded, but now it's, it's dropped. And as you can see, it's exposed the beams, which is quite a concern to the uh, the people who run the uh, the, the site from the uh, from the Flanders Field Museum. Um, and that's why we're trying to raise money to put it back into some sort of state of, of repair. This is the history of the Sixth Battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment by Captain E. V. Tempest, DSOMC. And the chapter that he's got on the Eep Salient says everything actually. So I'll read a little bit from it from it for you. It says, for the British Army there was only one salient. So much misery, mud and murder was nowhere else compressed into such small, smaller space. The ground reeked with gas, was polluted with dead and the debris of a hundred battles. It was tortured by an everlasting storm of shells. There was no possibility of peace or safety in the salient. No regular division had stayed in the line for more than six weeks, even in summer, and the battalion looked forward to an early move when it first arrived there. For certainly six months, however, during perhaps the worst winter of the war, the finale came in the gas attack of December, and the line was held and the salient saved. It is not easy to appraise just the importance of, diff of different phases of the war, and the spectacular events of 19 will always receive the praise and special attention which great victories merit. But the victories around Cambrai and Valencian were made possible by the endurance and self-sacrifice of battalions who in the dark days of the war held a thin line against a much stronger foe and under incredibly vile conditions. Throughout these six months, the men of the battalion were faced with two tasks. First, to keep, the back, to keep back the enemy. Second, to live and still preserve their sanity in a sea of mud. One of our battalion sergeants, Sergeant J. E. Yates, wrote, if I were to pick from a variegated career, the period when, a phys when physical wretchedness reached its stark bottom, I should choose the last five months at Ypres in 1915. We started in exuberant health and spirits at Christmas those who were left crawled out, broken in body and almost in heart, staggering and falling like drunken men after a march of five miles. Rain fell incessantly. An eminent statement once said he was never impressed by a case unless it was understated. It would be impossible to overstate or exaggerate in any way the misery of conditions in the salient in the winter of 1915. And I think that particular piece is everything about what the men who Dugby's Trench from the 49th West Riding Division with the 1st, 6th, 1st, 7th, 1st, 8th Battalions of the West Yorkshire Regiment suffered in this particular spot. So we're now going to leave the trench and hope that we can raise enough money to put it back into a condition where people can actually learn from it. It's as important now as it, as it ever was, particularly what's happening in Europe at the moment, to keep places like this as a memorial to what it means for peace and freedom.